Hi all, my name is Mike Troy. I'm a patient advocate with the Young Lung Cancer Initiative, and I'm joined today by Dr. Tejas Patel, who is an assistant professor of medicine and thoracic medical oncologist at the University of Colorado and Schutz Medical Campus. Dr. Patil is a recognized expert in oncogene-driven lung cancers and is joining me today to discuss the problem of drug tolerance and resistance in oncogene-driven non-small cell lung cancer. So, Dr. Patil, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, I've wanted to talk to you for a long time. I first saw your posts on um, X, I guess, and I just immediately thought you kind of offered some of the most insightful commentary in all sort of academic thoracic oncology. And uh, once I realized you kind of focus your research on these drug tolerant persister cells, I knew you were kind of the right person to talk with our audience about that. Thanks again. I know I know you're busy, but uh, we appreciate the time. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And I really appreciate the ability to talk with you and your audience and share some things that get me excited about where the field's going. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, just from my own vantage point, trying to delve into the literature as an advocate and a caregiver, I think one thing that strikes me is just how critical drug tolerant persister cells are and the idea of this tolerance and how it might play into the the rise of this resistance in oncogene driven lung cancers. But I think before we get into all of that, it might be helpful just to set out some background because I think a lot of people who find themselves in the situation where they have to think about oncogene driven lung cancers kind of hear all these buzzwords of drug tolerance, resistance, tyrosine mm -hmm. kinases, targeted therapies, mutations. And, you know, it's hard to fit all the pieces together and understand conceptually how they relate to one another. So maybe that we could just set some background there. For starters, what do we mean by something being a cancer being oncogene driven? or oncogene addicted. Yeah, it's a great place. And I think getting some of the terminology here straight because things can get very complicated very quickly. And I think having our definitions outlined in advance will help the audience hopefully appreciate some of the concepts that come with talking about drug tolerant persister cells. So one of the most common terms we'll hear is oncogene driven. And what does that mean? What is oncogene driven? Sometimes you'll see the phrase oncogene addicted. They're synonymous in my, in my view. So an oncogene is a gene that when it's mutated promotes uncontrolled cell growth. And an analogy I like to use is if your car is going down the highway, there are two potential serious problems that could occur. If one is your accelerator gets stuck and it just keeps going and going and going, and there's no way to stop it. That is an oncogene. An oncogene is a stuck accelerator. The other problem that you could have is a loss of the brakes, meaning you're going really fast, but there's no real way to stop cancer growth. Those are tumor suppressors. And when you don't have tumor suppressors, you've lost the brakes. And it's this balance between acceleration and brakes that are really critical for regulating cell cycle growth. So when we talk about oncogene-driven lung cancers, fundamentally, we're talking about a genetic event that when it occurs in a cancer cell, and this can occur in the form of a mutation, such as a point mutation. The best example of this is like an EGFR L858R mutation. That's a point mutation, a single gene, or rather a single amino acid sequence has been changed, and that's resulting in uncontrolled growth. Sometimes we can get it gene rearrangement. So the most common example of that is an EML4 ALK fusion. So what's happening there is one gene from a part of chromosome, in this case, chromosome two, is coming in close proximity to another gene. This fusion, which is not supposed to normally occur, is creating a mutation which causes uncontrolled cell growth. So many cancers are oncogene driven and the key concept here is that while it is possible that many other mutations can occur at the same time, it is not only believed, but in practice possible to just block the oncogene and slow down cellular growth. So you might see in a molecular report that, a, you know, you, I'm here, I'm speaking to the patient, might have an EML4 ALK fusion. And in the report, there might be other mutations like TP53, CDKN2A. But the key point here is that the key mutation that matters is the oncogene. And that allows us to 
potentially target an oncogene and shut down its growth. Now, how do these mutations drive abnormal cell growth? So DNA mutations change the structure of proteins. In lung cancer, many of these mutations occur in something called receptor tyrosine kinases. We'll cover this concept a little bit more. And they affect downstream signaling. And what happens when you get these mutations in oncogenes is that it renders certain growth pathways constitutively, act, constitutively active. Another way of saying this is that the receptor is on even without any signal from the environment telling it to turn on. It is unregulated. And the result of this is persistent activation of other growth signaling pathways, such as the MAP kinase pathway. And this results in rapid and uncontrolled cell division. Okay. So just to take one step back, because I think, you know, sort of an obvious and common question that people get is, how did I get this? And obviously, when you talk about genetics, I think the first thing everybody's mind jumps to is, did I inherit this? Is this heritable? But I guess the, the term somatic mutation gets thrown around a bit. So could you just explain somatic mutations and what that means? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, and I frequently get asked this question. So I think it's worth spending some time and, and dissecting this out. When we think of inherited risk of cancer, we're typically talking about something called a germline mutation. The best example of this is mutations in BRCA1 or BRCA2. These are genes that, if there were a mutation in these genes, can be passed along to children. And this is most well studied in breast cancer. So we know okay. that women who have BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes can increase the risk that their children may have breast cancer, specifically if their children are women. Uh -huh. That is different than what we typically see in lung cancer. So as far as I'm aware, there's very few hereditary subtypes of lung cancer. I won't cover them. There are a couple, but uh -huh. not anywhere near as common as what we see with breast cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer. These are some very common cancers where there is a clear family hereditary risk pool. We don't see that with lung cancer. A second question I get asked is, is there some environmental cause? Why did I get this in the first place? And I think there we don't really know. I wish I had a more satisfying answer for most of my patients. There is some risk with ionizing radiation exposure. For example, RET fusions tend to occur in patients who've had some type of ionizing radiation. That being said, most of my patients do not have this kind of exposure. Most mm -hmm. of my patients have never smoked. Most of my patients don't live in highly polluted cities. And so I think the short answer is we don't really understand the risk exposure very well. But what we do know is that if a patient has a somatic mutation, that means that through whatever environmental risks in the and, and genetic risks that the patient mm -hmm. had, the cancer arrived. But this cancer is not heritable in the sense that I was talking about earlier. Gotcha. You know, it's in germline tumors. Yeah. Okay. And so just, just turning back to the point you talked about earlier. So, you know, you have this somatic mutation. It's not something that's heritable. It results in this mutated protein. Mm -hmm. How does having this mutation all of a sudden lead to this crazy cancer cell growth? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I mentioned the concept of a receptor tyrosine kinase earlier. It's a very central concept in biology, and basically the underlying premise is very simple. A cell has to have some kind of way of communicating with its environment. So we all know that cells have a lipid membrane, so that's what protects the inner contents from the external mm -hmm. environment. However, the cells have to interact with the environment. And so they have these little things that connect from the intracellular side to the extracellular side. And these anchors are called receptor tyrosine kinase. And okay. they can respond to growth signals from the environment. And these growth signals can say, we need more of this specific type of cell. Please grow more of them. Or we've had enough. We need to slow down. Please stop the growth. And these are highly, highly regulated processes. So cell growth is extremely well controlled in the normal setting. What happens with cancer is that the effect of the growth signal or the growth blocker, depending on the context, doesn't matter anymore because there's a mutation in the receptor tyrosine kinase 
that is essentially an on switch. Now, when we're talking about oncogenes, this is what we're talking about. And this has also led to the evolution of targeted therapies that can block these receptor tyrosine kinases. There's two ways to block them. You can block them from the extracellular side. So the outside of the cell can have the target, typically where the growth signal binds. That's the one target. Okay. That'd be like an antibody maybe? Yeah. So the most well-studied antibody would be something like amivantamap that's been used in lung cancer. Uh -huh. In colon cancer, there's a type of antibody called cetuximab, which blocks the EGFR receptor tyrosine kinase but does so from the outside. So it's very different from how we would treat it in lung cancer, where the EGFR receptor tyrosine kinase is actually blocked from the inside, from the intracellular compartment. So when we block the intracellular compartment, we actually use a specific type of therapy called a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. These are small molecules that bind to a very specific part of the receptor tyrosine kinase called the ATP binding pocket. And this is what then prevents that whole structure from unregulated growth signal promotion. So it's quite different than chemotherapy. Chemotherapy fundamentally works on the premise that the anti-cancer effects disproportionately affect rapidly growing cells. This is different. This is a focused therapy that is very unique to a very specific receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So if we use EGFR as an example, the drug that is most commonly used in the United States is a drug called Ocimert. It binds the receptor tyrosine kinase pocket on the intracellular side and thereby reduces growth, the EGFR protein that is abnormally active. Okay. So just to sum it up, kind of, so we have this genetic mutation that gives rise to this mutant protein could be a mutation or a fusion. And that mutant protein is, is one of these receptor tyrosine kinases. It's this kind of gate or channel between the cell itself and the extracellular rest of the body, basically. And uh, the mutation results in hyperactivation, but we have these two classes of drugs, these targeted therapies. One, the tyrosine kinase inhibitor binds to this ATP pocket, which like in biology, I think most people are familiar with ATP powers the cell. So that kind of shuts that down. And then you have the antibody, which is kind of on that extracellular part of the receptor tyrosine kinase that, that blocks the signaling from outside the cell coming in. Yeah, that's okay. a good summary. Yeah. And I mean, on the broadest sense, I think it's sometimes helpful to think about how these things interact normally. Mm -hmm. In normal process, let's say you cut your skin and your body is trying to heal the wound, it will probably secrete a variety of growth signals so that skin cells start to divide and start to cover up the area where there is a wound. Those growth signals typically bind receptor tyrosine kinases along skin cells that allow them to grow because there's a signal coming from the environment saying, please make more of yourself. Uh -huh. That signal from the extracellular environment binds the extracellular domain of the receptor tyrosine kinase. That triggers an intracellular signal to say to the cell, please grow more. And then at a certain point, once a critical mass of skin cells have been achieved, there are negative regulators from the environment that say stop growth. So this um, is a very coordinated process. And I think one thing that is important to understand about cancer is that go from this coordination effect to a completely unregulated and uncoordinated process. And that typically happens at the level of the receptor tyrosine kinase. It's a genetic event, but it affects the protein construction of the receptor tyrosine kinase. And that's why you get these abnormal effects. But that's also why drugs like tyrosine kinase inhibitors in certain patients who have oncogenes can be so effective. 